Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Northampton School Board meeting for Thursday, November 5th. We are uh, live streaming on YouTube TV uh, coming from Winnicott High School Auditorium. Just wanted to make everyone aware there is a 15 second delay on the on the YouTube live stream. So uh, if we have some awkward pauses, we're just uh, maybe letting, letting some time pass for the home viewers to catch up. Um, so uh, we're going to start with a quick roll call of the members here so that so uh, people can hear. I guess we'll go from the bottom. Yeah, want to do the roll call? Yeah, do the roll call. Here. 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 All right. We're all here. <laughs> so the next item on the agenda is a uh, public comment, uh, questions and comments from those in attendance. When you, uh, when, Liam, when you come to the <laughs> to the microphone, just state your name and uh, your address, please, for the for the home viewers, and the record, so you're so you're on record. Thank you, thank you, uh, Liam Needham, 15 Hampshire Road, Northampton, um, here tonight on behalf of uh, Northampton Youth Association um, basketball, specifically, uh, just asking. Uh, you, the board to revisit the outside um, organization use of the gym. Uh, just some context um, for NHYA. Uh, historically, we have uh, generally had about 90 kids from Northampton in the program, uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, our third through sixth graders would play on a travel team. So they traveled to different towns, uh, Greenland, Stratum, just local areas. And um, you know that's provided a challenge for us this year. So <clears throat> this season, we've actually partnered with uh, Hampton Youth Association, HYA, to offer uh, gameplay for fifth through eighth graders. And you know we think that is the best approach given circumstances, coordination between SAU 21 and SAU 90, keep kids in Hampton, Northampton, Hampton Falls, Seabrook, uh, and Southampton just all together. Uh, rather than crossing uh, towns and different facilities. Um, you know, one of the goals for us at, at NHYA is to expand this a little bit. Um, and with the use of Northampton Gym, we think we can open it up to third and fourth graders, maybe more, uh, depending on, on gym availability and, and how many kids um, sign up. So, um, you know, we want to do that. We want to provide the opportunity for uh, social and emotion emotional development for the kids. Uh, we want to do it safely. Um, and, you know, we recognize that coordination, um, you know, of, of any issues um, would have to be pretty tight. And I think we can we can make it work with just Hampton, Northampton, SAUs coming together. Um, you know, there's some other safety protocols put in place by HYA with temperature checks, um, limiting the amount of people in the gym, everyone wearing a mask, you know, sort of the, the common thread of, of what is happening today. Uh, so that that's pretty much it in a, in a nutshell. Um, thanks for the time. I know I did distribute the handouts earlier to you guys, so um, thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, Liam. Okay, and for viewers at home that want to join the public comment, we do have a phone number that you can call in and get connected to the meeting. That phone number is 603-758-9367. And uh, I believe when you call in, will it go right there? Go right here. We'll go Stay right there to that phone, and Mr. Hobbs will use all his AV skills to uh, get that to work. <laughs> so. While we're letting for the 15-second delay and uh, letting people give, giving people at home some time to consider, we'll just take a peek at our upcoming meeting dates. SAU 21 Joint Board Public Hearing and Meeting will be Monday, November 9th. Uh, I believe we're right here in the auditorium again. Is that correct? No, that one's remote. No, that one is remote. Sorry about that. Uh, and that's at 6 p.m. Uh, and then our next Northampton School Board meeting. Uh, will be Thursday, December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. And I believe we will try to do that live as well, at the very least in the high school auditorium. So if you are at home and have a question or comment, again, the phone number is 603-758-9367.
Yeah, I think we'll just leave a minute or a minute or so. It's like Friday night waiting by the phone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Cindy Burke to her first to her first, not her, to not her first school board meeting, but for her returning, uh, Cindy is filling the vacant seat that, um, that we have, has graciously agreed to come back on and help us out. Cindy was on the school board uh, for one full term uh, about two years ago. Um, so it's great to have you back, Cindy. Thank, Thank you, you for, for volunteering. Thank you. Okay. So I'll unplug this so it doesn't ring during the meeting. Um, you want to you want to leave it open, just for a moment in case in case we'll, we'll leave a little uh, leeway if the board is okay with that. For okay, moving on. Uh, next is our. Get this right in front of me. Uh, we have a student. Our student representative. Sorry, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, Folks, uh, my name is Andrew Wallace. I am not a member of North Han uh, resident of North Hampton, but I am the president of the Sea Coast Asso Education Association. Sorry, I'm going to be committed to speak. Uh, I will ask the board if they were. So, okay. typically, uh, residents of North Hampton are, are speaking at these, but in, in the past, we have allowed uh, people that have connections to the schools. So, if that's okay with the board, I'm okay. I think we're okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, my name is Andrew Wallace. I'm the president of Seacoast Education Association. Thank you very much for the chance to address the board tonight. And thank you for your work on behalf of students and teachers in SAU 21. We recognize that everyone, our students, our communities, and our teachers, staff, and administration are all struggling right now in different ways during the COVID pandemic. It is more important than ever for all of us to support and empathize with one another. Every day we see tremendous courage and care shown by our teachers and students in our schools. We want to thank our students, our families, and our teachers for your hard work and fortitude over these past months. The hours and hours of preparation and work and grading and homework and parents helping with homework and reading, and taking care of kids, obviously, and everything that you all do. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our teachers who are currently teaching remotely are excited about the prospect of returning to an in-person teaching and learning environment. We teachers and staff have really missed connecting with our students, and we miss the magic and the fun and the discovery and the triumphs that happen in our classrooms during a normal year. Like students and families, we're looking forward to returning to in-person learning in a safe environment. As always, the health and safety of our students, their families, this community, and of course, our fellow teachers, our custodial staff, our administrators, <laughs> our nurses, our paraprofessionals, everyone. They continue to be our top priority. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has reached record levels in New Hampshire and throughout the country in a second wave. According to the numbers, our middle and high school students are more likely to contract and spread COVID-19. Regardless of how much we want to be done with this illness, COVID is not done with us yet. In addition, the cold and flu season also currently ramping up will create additional challenges for schools, staff, and students alike with a shortage of substitutes. So we all have to be vigilant about the safety protocols that the SAU has put in place, maintaining proper spacing, wearing masks, and especially cleaning. They are working. Our ability for our elementary schools to stay in person or the future for our more populated middle and high schools to transition to in-person learning depends on that. While this year has been incredibly challenging, it has been so rewarding. We are employees who are doing our best to uphold our professional responsibilities, and our priority has been our students. Some of us are also parents ourselves who have had to react to decisions made by surrounding school boards in the various communities where we live. We want you to know that we understand your concerns and frustrations, and we share your hopes and excitement for the future. We're in awe of the resilience that our schools and community have <coughs> excuse me continually displayed together in facing the challenges of the school year, and we look forward to our success together. 
Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does it look like we have anyone else present? And we don't have any phone calls coming in, so we're going to shut the line down. Uh, and moving on, we have our uh, student government representative, Kayla Hyatt. Couldn't be with us tonight, but she's prepared a nice video to give us some insights as to what's going on in the school. And we're going to show that. So I'm going to step away from the microphone and get a better view. Six feet away.
Thank you, Susan. That was great. Does anyone have any questions for Stu? That was a lot of fun. It set the bar very high. I think the kids, some of the kids in there in my neighborhood, some I know, some I live with, <laughs> but uh, I think they really enjoyed getting in, in, into school and interacting and doing that a lot. It meant a lot. And so we look forward to our further discussion tonight about that. Okay, next we have some approval of the minutes. Our first is from October 1st. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the October 1st. Do you want to do these together or separately? I think first we have to do them separately. separately yeah. right? First um, meeting. Except for I have to abstain for three out of four. We'll go separate. Yeah, I think we have to go separate based yeah. on the voting and abstaining. Yep. Let us know when you're ready, Rhonda. Do we have a second on that one anyways? I'll second. Thank you. Any discussion while Rhonda's catching up? Tom made the motion and Nermina seconded. I was just thinking that too. So I think in the past, even in normal circumstances, we've also done a visual or an out loud so that people can see and hear because they can't always see us on. So I'll just ask for a quick. I'll just ask for a quick roll call on each one as well as the electronic vote so the viewers can see. Okay. Do you want to do a quick roll call on that vote? Abstain. Yes. 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 <coughs> okay. Next set of minutes. Greg, I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the October 15th meeting. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. 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 Thank you, Rhonda. Can I do the roll? Sure. Oh, sure. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the October 21st um, budget review meeting minutes. A second. Any further discussion? Nope. All right. We're ready for a vote. That was fast, Rhonda. Hang on a minute. Abstain. Yes. 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 And Greg, I'd like to make a motion to approve the October 27th budget review meeting minutes. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? No. Okay. We're ready to vote. Yes. 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 I was just looking at the notes down below in the box where it has Cindy abstaining. Does that matter? Because she was there. I wanted to remove that from oh, okay. I did not refresh. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Correspondences and commendations. I'll look to Sue and 
I'm sorry. He did. So I have um, two. One of them is a little bit longer than usual because I wanted to write it out. Um, the first one is for um, our school counselor, Deb Vasconcelos, who's um, actually been involved in a number of social emotional um, and initiatives at the school recently. Um, Deb Vasconcelos and Patrick Guidi planned the SEL days for the middle school students that were really highly successful and they did that in collaboration with the middle school team. Um, Deb Vaz has also been coordinating um, lessons and um, videos on personal safety with all students in, in grades K to four. And um, additionally, she's worked with Caroline Erkelian and helped to implement the um, suicide prevention workshop that took place on November 3rd that was required by um, one of the new New Hampshire state laws. So um, she's really been super active in, in helping make sure that students and staff are all doing okay during all of this, um, of the pandemic. And the second one really is for our entire staff. And I just wanted to write it out for you because I just, I, I feel like they just go so above and beyond and there's things that maybe folks don't see. So I'm gonna read it this time. I'd like to commend the Northampton teachers and staff for their work in supporting students' social emotional needs, maintaining a safe environment for student learning, delivering high quality instruction despite the many challenges we currently face, and supporting one another through this difficult time. When I say Northampton teachers and staff, I mean everyone who works in our school, from our custodians, office staff, cafeteria workers, and EAs, to teachers, special educators, related service providers, and administrators. In the best of times, students come to us with their hopes, fears, and insecurities. In times like these, their fears and insecurities are heightened, and the adults carry them as well. Our staff are able to put aside their own fears and worries in order to provide for the children of Northampton. They do things that members of the community may not notice or be able to see. They teach kids each day and let them know they'll help them. In some cases, teachers have had to adjust instructional practices that they may not have chosen otherwise. Some need to teach little ones while they sit at desks in a classroom where they once gathered on the rug for a story or huddled around a kidney table for group work. Some need to teach using Zoom and breakout rooms and Google Classrooms. Some need, to, some need to zoom into a class that they cannot easily see, when they cannot easily see all the students. And some have utilized outdoor space in ways we never dreamed possible. Who would have thought that to clip chart paper to the backstop of the softball field so that kids could see the chart outdoors? Or who would have thought to put batteries in the Red Cat amplification system and bring it outside so kids could hear their teacher better? They've made these adjustments that have enabled them to continue to deliver high quality instruction that leads to student growth and achievement. In short, NHS faculty and staff have put kids first, despite the variety of opinions about what school should look like and how we should be operating. They quietly do their jobs while at times putting your kids before the needs of their own families. I will always advise them to take care of themselves first so they can continue to do their very best for Northampton School. They have my respect and admiration every day. Thank you. Thank they're you. really, I mean, they're amazing. So just wanted to give them a shout out. And then I think Aisha has a couple things. Hello. So first, I would like to commend Carly Herlihy for her work with student government to create the weekly Friday announcements and the creation of this year's Veterans Day video for our community. Also, I would like to commend Kat Tharp for creating the Halloween video for our families, and also Brenda Tharp for her leadership in the Coder Z, an online coding platform through which students learn valuable STEM skills such as coding, robotics, and physical computing. Brenda Tharp is working with our fifth grade students during their school day as well as outside of class. Rebecca Jones and Chris um, LaCroix are making this experience available for our students in grades six through eight during the win blocks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I one if I may, Greg. Okay, yeah. Any so members? I would also <coughs> like to um, make a commendation. I had the <coughs> honor and privilege of attending the budget committee meeting with Matt Ferrara the other day on Monday. And Matt did a fantastic job uh, representing the work that the administration and this board did in preparation for that meeting. Um, your presentation skills, your professionalism, 
your ability to answer questions um, and also defer questions when appropriate um, is fantastic. And the budget committee themselves made that um, observation. So thank you, Matt, for all of your hard work. Thank you, Matt. Anybody else? All right. Thank you. Okay, moving on to school educational update. Our school council. Is that you? <laughs> um, so last month's meeting was uh, largely taken up with um, with conversations about adjustments due to the pandemic. And I think one of the biggest ones were, were the conversation was the liveliest, and um, Greg was with us if he wants to add any details, was just around um, what the parameters are and how teachers can provide um, meaningful work for students who need to quarantine. So we have you know, our K-5 students in person in school, but we had a large number of students that needed to quarantine recently, and um, we're finding there's different you know, waves of students. But at one point, we had almost 40 kids quarantining at the same time, and so, um, and, and teachers that were still in school needed to provide work for them. So we, we had a, kind of a lively discussion about what that might look like and how teachers would be checking in via Zoom with students who were quarantining at home even though they um, couldn't attend in class uh, sessions. So that was really the, the bulk of the, of the meeting last month. Did you want to add anything? Yes, I think it becomes quite apparent. I mean, you guys live it every day. We, we don't as board members and as parents and community. But I, I think for me, last week really highlighted the fact that running two models of education is extremely difficult. Yeah. Extremely difficult. It taxes the teachers in ways that, uh, as you guys know as professionals, but we don't always see from preparation to how do you, how do you deal with a portion of your class that's out and a portion that's in. And we, and we had some good conversations around it. I mean, the room and Zoom thing came up a, a couple of times as well, and we know that there's parameters around that. Um, but I think the, the group also seemed open to, you know, trying to do what's best for the kids. And that, that was very apparent in that conversation as well, that the, the teachers want to be back in school and they want the kids there in front of them as well. Um, but understanding the circumstances, there's a lot of variables at play. Um, but it, it's extremely difficult. It's a very complex um, process. Yeah, and, and then at yeah. the same time, we had two, two teachers and full classes at home quarantining, and um, that gave us a chance to kind of test drive some of the new, um, the new improvements that, that, that we have. And so we've, we had purchased some more take-home materials this year so that the first grade and the third grade class that had to quarantine were able to take they had some foundations take home materials that they could use in the first grade class and they could pick up their math books and they could pick up um, their devices. So having the one-to-one -one devices really enabled the teachers, to, to the elementary teachers, I should say, to teach in a way that they hadn't been able to last spring. And so that was um, also a, you know, a bit of a learning curve and it gave us a chance for them to share that experience with um, the rest of the teachers. So that took up, you know, that took up a, Almost the whole hour. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Uh, one, Any, wait, hey, yeah. you come back here. <laughs> I think we might have some questions. Yeah, no, I okay. don't have a question. I just have a quick observation. So, first of all, uh, thank you because um, while those two, to the administration and to the, the uh, teachers, because while those two classes needed to be quarantined for a couple of days, the fact that you all were on top of it, found it, acted, and did it, it makes our, our school and our community safer. And then I would just say um, a, a plea. Um, and, and, and um, echoing what Andrew Wallace said, if you're in doubt, if you're, you think your kid's sick, play it safe, keep them home, please. I mean, the, the thing that I think we felt um, the most optimistic about after the need to quarantine, they, were, you know, they had to quarantine for 14 days and um, no other students or staff tested positive that had, um, that had had that exposure. So I think the wearing the masks, the distancing, the way, the school's been set up has been um, pretty effective. So we were, we were very relieved um, to, to find that no one else had tested positive after yeah. that, so. Good, thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, and actually I'm just gonna touch upon one more thing, it, the, the size of the classrooms, the cohorts, and I, and I know this is one of the comments and, and I'll say it, sort of open up the conversation, but for people at home, um, if there's people that are watching, I think 
these meetings can also serve to sort of educate people as to the complexities of it. I know early in our conversation, Dr. Lupini, I, I, I personally was questioning the, the, the cohort size um, because there was you know six feet apart, but limited to cohorts. It seemed like a little contradictory to me, but um, you know, it turns out it, it was the right thing to do from, from, for multiple reasons, but one is to be able to control an outbreak, and I think we saw that in Seabrook, or you saw that in Seabrook early on. So just, ex just taking the opportunity to kind of touching upon that is that these cohorts of 10 to 12 are really designed for the outbreak, really. It wasn't designed, uh, six feet is the in-person kind of solution, but the outbreak, to be able to control it and contact trace is really where the 10 to 12 person pods come in to be able to control it and trace it and contain it very quickly. And, and, I th and that's, I think, what happened at Northampton. We were able to contain yeah. without shutting down the whole school, and that's what yes. happened in some other districts. That's right. Yeah, so I think it's important to kind of explain the cohort thing to, to, to people, to all the people here tonight and all the <laughs> people at home. <laughs> so. Any, uh, any other dis discussion? Good, all right. Moving on, we are have a policy. Yes, so uh, second read. So these policies have all gone through a first read. Uh, they were taken to the joint board. We didn't have uh, representation, adequate representation from one of the boards there. So the decision was made to bring them back out to each board. Um, these are these have been vetted by the policy subcommittee and already gone through a first read at each of our, our boards. So you'll be our third, Rhonda, is that correct? Third board. Um, with this group of policies that's already gone through that part of the process. Very good, and I think, Tom, you had your capable eyes on these as our policy emeritus. That is true, and as a result, I'd like to make a motion to approve policies BCB, DAF 1 through 11, EFAA, and IK as recommended by the Policy Committee. I'll second. Any further discussion? Yes. 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 Okay. Since we are in the policy section, um, I don't know if this is the proper place, but since we're discussing policies, uh, uh, one of our um, town's folks has spoken earlier, speaking to the board here. Um, about looking at our current uh, sort of state of emergency policy around use of the gym. And so um, I, th I think it's probably something that we could discuss and could consider. Uh, we're seeing the um, uh, organizations open up a little bit more, um, but I think maybe it's the point where we can kind of get some thoughts on, on, um, on our current um, temporary policy around use of our gymnasium. So I'll, I'll, if I may start, Greg, um, so just to make sure that we say it out loud for the public, especially coming back to school, bringing kids back in school, um, my recollection is we wanted to be very careful and make sure that we weren't allowing outside groups who could uh, potentially spread uh, coronavirus in throughout the school and to kind of maintain those pods as we discussed. I think we still need to be careful, especially coming into um, kind of cold and flu season and, and you know less ventilation, less kids outdoors. Um, that said, I also wonder if, if, if this is limited to the gym and if there's separate entrance and exit and if we're not using the gym for other instruction, if there may be an opportunity for us to explore allowing the gym for um, youth basketball to allow some of the, the kids, especially the middle schoolers, to, um, to get together at times. I think we need to balance that by listening to the administration and what the risks may be. I know Matt's done a lot of work uh, on that, so I'm eager to to listen to the opposing side. And then lastly is, if now's not the time, that's okay. Um, I think if we could let the community know how frequently or what cadence we would be looking at it again, I think um, that would be helpful. So those are just my initial thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Tom. All right, does anyone else have any thoughts? And then I think we'll get some op other opinions. So it sounds like, um, HYA and NHYA are joining forces for the older kids, so they're looking mostly for the little guys. So it enforces some of those Korean, so obviously, all the opening up of schools for everybody except Spanish or basketball. 
I think. My, so my understanding is that um, they're starting it with um, with five through eight, but they're looking for places to play. They don't have enough places to play, so they're looking to to have have a gym, and then if they can, then they may be able to expand it to um, the, some of the younger grades as well. But they're looking for a place to play. Yeah. And our, our regular policy gives us the leeway to to kind of do this case by case. So I, I don't think by allowing this if if that's a decision that we open up like floodgates for for everything it's it's mm -hmm. o the policy has always stated that it would be that it's a case by case uh, sort of okay. sort of proposition um, but i think i think if you're prepared matt or, or we can we <coughs> well i'm not certain if i'd say prepared but i'm not <laughs> i can certainly provide some kind of yeah our uh, kind of our decision point as far as facilities use um, because as an SAU as you, you're aware we have limited um, facilities use to only outdoor events where we're not allowing out, um, outside organizations into any of our facilities SAU wide and I you know I I think that the challenge that um, that these youth basketball associations are facing as far as gym space is due to the fact that it is, I mean, that it is a concern and many places are not allowing indoor <laughs> gym, I mean, frankly, because it's the, the high potential for transmission rate. I mean, when you think of, when you think of, uh, you know, particularly when, when you're talking about basketball with, with the close contact and heavy breathing in, in an indoor contained space, the, I mean, that it's a much higher risk than the, the outdoor, um, you know, activities that we've, 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 we've allowed and, and we, we actually did not allow out um, for athletics at the middle school level at the K level and that has not been and that further that hasn't been determined as far as the winter sports at the K school so we're not even sure if we will be having a basketball season at the K level um, so I think it's something that we're continuing to monitor um, something that we we're, we're obviously very interested in because on the flip side, we do recognize the importance of, of you know, these extracurricular activities, sports. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a critical um, SEL component of, of all of our, um, you know, all of the, these um, students and kids' lives. So we, we understand how important it is. We just need to be cognizant of the, the risk factors, um, and, and currently. Um, where we, we feel that these indoor activities are, 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 are pretty high risk. Um, you know, when I think, oh, what was I? Lost my train of thought. Um, in any event, um, you know, it's something that we're, we're certainly open to and we will, as far as like, as we progress through and we, 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 we see what, you know, the transmission rates are and what the, you know, what we, what we decide to do as a school as, uh, and as a SAU as far as, as athletics. And then at that point, we might be, you know, we might look at potentially opening up to outside organizations. But I think, you know, it might be somewhat odd if we, if we open up our gym to, a, to basketball and then we don't offer basketball. And I'm not saying that's going to be the case. We, we, we very well could, but. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to point. answer any questions. Can I jump in on that? On that? So um, a couple things. Um, we've gone out of our way to try to work with organizations that normally have used our facilities to say that if they had other sites, we would bus kids to those sites. That's happened with Northampton Rec, and that's happened with the SAS program in Seabrook, both programs that normally survive in our building. Um, it's my understanding from talking to the Hampton superintendent that while the board gave a tentative approval for the use of their gym, that they're going to reconsider that on November the 10th. So, so I'm, not, I'm not sure that they have other sites as well. Matt's right. I was involved in a pretty lengthy discussion today uh, about high school sports and whether indoor sports are going to take place. Um, the, the predominant feeling in that room among superintendents is that middle school sports again probably would not take place and they didn't in the fall um, but so high school would. pardon but high school would high school may 
Some sports probably won't, um, although we're not there yet on that, and the NHIAA is not there yet on that. Some may not. Um, there are a lot of questions about wrestling, for example. There are a lot of questions about swimming, um, those kinds of sports. Some others may. Um, but, um, but to set the high school issue aside for, for a second, um, our recommendation that would be that we stick with our, our present uh, uh, protocols across the SAU that the joint board agreed to back in August. We believe they've been part of what's made us successful in terms of bringing kids in. And as you're going to hear tonight, we're going to try to bring more kids in um, in all of our schools, uh, in all the schools that are remote right now. And I think it's worth us sticking with the protocols as they are in place um, through through the next few months as we as we continue to see rates go up uh, in all of our communities. Yeah, actually, the, in the one the one other item that I neglected to mention that I'm I'm would be concerned about is that um, that cohort control that we've been. We, we speak of all the all the time. It sounds like there's a, a fair amount of, of mixing of different towns, and um, you know, it sounds like SAU 90, SAU 21, and all, and all of these communities, um, and that's just um, problematic when we're talking about trying to maintain that, that co cohort so, control. So, I, to that end, I don't want to get specific on this because so we had. We've had a number of situations recently, one which impacted Northampton School. It is exactly what Matt's talking about. Kids from multiple communities with a coach from another community, someone tests positive, we begin to have issues across a number of, of schools which really complicated uh, the situation. So um, I, I, I agree, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I think I think I'm going to have to politely disagree with you about, uh, on the on the outdoor fall sports. Like, if we're going to hold sports and if we're going to hold it at the at the high school level, and we're going to put kids back in school, then I think we have to consider a controlled community use of of the gymnasium. I think there's a way to do it. There's probably a way to do it with with limiting. Um, you know, people try to limit parents, although they, they don't always like to follow the rules, but. Um, especially in the case of like basketball we have teams of 10 you can maintain a cohort um you know so, some of these fall sports uh, soccer and football you're you're going nose to nose with a guy you're sweating you're six inches away from his face and you're playing exeter dover many more multiple towns so i, I don't subscribe to the to, to to that notion of it um but i, I do respect the safety protocols but I, I do want to call a spade a spade here and if we're if we're doing it just because you're outdoors you know, it doesn't mean you're safe you're still interacting with as many people and in the case of those sports you're in very very close proximity um so uh, i just want to make sure that i'm, I'm my, that i'm giving you my opinion so uh, i don't want to disagree well. i don't want to disagree yeah. with you i i i i was not in favor of 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 um of what we ended up doing this fall. Um, quite frankly, when the schools around us all went and our ADs were able to work with one another to come up with some type of cohort control that said this is Exeter week, this is Timberlane week, that at least put some controls in place that wouldn't be in place in a normal, mm -hmm. in a normal season. Um, given what you saw in various communities, Portsmouth, Dover, um, uh, uh, Rochester and others and the political pressure that came down around high school sports, we signed off. Yeah. Yeah, I guess my, my opinion to follow up, and thank you both, um, is I absolutely agree that it needs to be uh, school first and safety first. We don't want to take um, uncalculated risks and jeopardize the ability to have kids in school. Um, that said, I also, I wonder if if you looked at each facility across the SAU, and I know we're only talking about Northampton here, um, facility by facility, I look at that Northampton gym, I look at the fact that there's, I believe, a divider in it, there's separate entrances, you can limit access, you can the number of people that are in there, it's shut off from the rest of the school, um, giving our communities access to their facility for them to recreate, and we can't control um, who's meeting with whom outside of the, the schools, right? The, the um, cohorts within the schools. I think it's I think it's worth 
talking about what would be required from a cleaning perspective afterwards or what the real um, risk may be and you know are these kids going to be seeing each other anyways so I'm not looking to take uncalculated risks but more than just saying no we're not doing it at the SAU level um, I'd like to look at our facility to see if there's something we can do I'm not I started off by saying safety first and I believe that to be true um, but I don't want to say no too soon I agree I would agree with you thoughts from the north end of the table <laughs> I, I, I would agree uh, I wouldn't blankly say no but um, current cases going up different things but people live lives and, and work and these kids are exposed and they come to school and different things so we can't control everything um, we should definitely play it safe but if we can provide an opportunity for those kids to play even by themselves with themselves for our own school, then I would I would be in favor. Certainly. Yes, might be easier here. So, when when you're considering this, are you considering um, weekday use or just weekend use? Oh, just weekends. Well, weekends. Okay, because. My, my experience has been that they would be requesting to use the gym weekday evenings for practices and I feel like that would be really problematic for our custodial staff to be able to manage. It puts them at risk with the kids that are in the building and yep. the extra staff members. Uh, the staff members are then exposed to the air that's not turning over quickly enough with people that they're not generally exposed to so our custodians yep. would have a risk factor um, if they're covering the building and then in order to you know the air we do have the air exchanger on on full-time exchange but the gym with the high ceilings and the um, just the square footage would be uh, I think it's more difficult to change the air so if, if if groups were requesting to use it evenings for practices I think that would be highly problematic and I'm not sure that they could clean and sanitize to the extent that would be necessary so I just I, yeah. that yeah. is typically what they ask is to have practices during the weekend games on the weekends so yeah and they might and I, and I wouldn't disagree with you I would call it a puzzle that needs solving and if okay. and if they if there's a HYA proposition and we can solve some of these challenges then um, and we're playing sports at the high school level and there's like within the SAU there's sports going on um, I, I think it's worth Worth the conversation. I, worth I mean, I just wanted to ask the difference between weekend and weekday use, and, and also yeah. just kind of point out what Dr. Lupini pointed out about other groups that we have said that we're not able to accommodate, and I feel like it can be tricky to say yes to one group and no to another group, and it puts us in a position that can be uncomfortable in the community. It does put. The, so I, I think ultimately the, po the policy is the, it puts the board in that position because yeah. it's the board that makes that decision. Yeah. So, and so I, I just wanted to add those. I. I, I I, I hear you. Your 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 your, your note is du duly understood. Um, I think some of these harder decisions have, are going to face us. You know, and we we can't be afraid of saying yes to one and no to another. Um, and I think as we move into the fall season, things get tricky. Uh, and physical activity and a change of scenery for the kids is a is a big thing and sports can provide a level of that we lose in daylight we're losing outdoor fields and courts and things like that and so we're, we're coming into a season where where um where kids and parents are going to be inside more than than they have been in the fall so I, I do think it's something to consider um so i think we've probably talked that one um so from a, from a board point of view, I, I would be comfortable, and I'd like to hear from you guys, I'd be comfortable um, following up with Mr. Needham and, and asking him for a more detailed idea of what this, what this would look like. So I, I, I agree. I think we'll be following up with Mr. Needham um, and also following up with um, the SAU and Northampton School Administration because some of the some of the compromises that we may need to make about not, not doing it during the weekday or um, understanding 
if there are additional costs to fog it after the weekend use or whatever we need to do, you know, buy more MERV 13 filters, whatever it is, we need to have the um, administration's input as well. That said, um, I'm leaning to try to find a way to make this both and, right? How, how can we figure out a way to, um, to provide an opening um, without compromising anybody's safety? Agree. Yes, Martin. If we want the conversation, if they can come up with the uh, safety plan that can be reviewed, the administration could uh, agree on. It's something we could actually accommodate. But uh, if there's any risk to putting kids out of school that are currently in school, we definitely need to weigh that to make sure the school stays open, at least at the level we're at, before I, opening it to the outside groups. Yeah, uh, Martin makes a really relevant point. It's uh, students in school first, so sports uh, is a nice, nice to have. Correct. But our priority is putting kids in the classroom. And I imagine that's, and I don't imagine, I know that's everyone's priority here too. Dr. Lapini, do we have um, someone that um, we consulted with on kind of infectious um, disease initially when we were putting together the plan? And, and are they still available to um, talk through with the, you know, regarding the Northampton gym or no? I don't know. He's not available. Okay. Um, not the person we were consulting with initially. Um, this doesn't mean we can't get that advice. And I'm, I'm not trying to overswing. I'm just, like I said, I want to make sure that we're making a balanced and fair um, decision. Um, and that's, that's why I was asking. And I'm not an infectious disease expert yet. Be better than you were last year. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you for uh, entertaining that lengthy discussion in Section Seven, which we didn't think was going to be that long, did we? Moving on to new business, we have a conversation around the, our recording secretary stipend. Right. So we've taken a look, and and uh, I, yes, I'm sure you know um, that in your budget. We've uh, increased the um, recording secretary meeting stipend from $110 to $125. We're attempting to standardize that across our elementary schools, which ranged anywhere from $84 a meeting to $118 a meeting. We're, we're, make, we're recommending, and um, our boards have incorpor been incorporating in their budgets, $125. What we're recommending tonight is that we do that effective with, uh, as of November 1st um, of this year. Uh, so that's the recommendation is to, um, to, to increase that stipend to $125 per meeting um, effective with this meeting. Well, based upon the length of our meetings and the quality of work reading the minutes, I would like to make a motion to increase the stipend for the school board recording secretary from 110 to 125 effective November 1st, 2020. Second. Any further discussion? As mentioned, this was a budget discussion as well, so. Quick round to get the vote out. Board we'll change your minds. <laughs> Rhonda, I don't see a maybe button. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Yes. 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 All right, thank you. Next under new business, reopening plans for second trimester. So let me say a couple words and then and then turn this over to the principal. Um, and I think Dr. Hobbs may have a few comments as well. Um, so uh, we a number of weeks ago, we uh, surveyed our staff um, and our parents. Uh, across the SAU. Staff survey was, was relative to a related issue, which I'm sure we'll get into a little bit in this conversation, uh, having to do with the holidays. Um, the parent survey was really around uh, what their interests were in terms of the model uh, that their children are involved in for the second trimester and the holidays. Um, the holiday question came up because DHHS currently has guidance that says that if you leave New England, you should quarantine for two weeks upon your return. 
we had heard talk among some other school districts, some of whom have since taken action on this issue, that they were looking, because of that DHHS guidance, they were looking at going remote for six weeks um, from Thanksgiving through the middle of January in order to accommodate staff and parents. Um, we, we don't have a recommendation on that piece of this because uh, my initial conversations with, with um, some members of some board was that that, that wasn't going to be viewed favorably. Um, that doesn't mean, by the way, that we're not going to have an issue. Um, we may have an issue where we may be forced into a remote based on numbers of students who are absent, based on numbers of staff who are absent. That, that's possible. And quite frankly, based on a couple conversations I had with parents, um, I'm concerned about people not being truthful with us um, about that because some expressed that they wouldn't be truthful with us about that to me. Is it New England or is it New Hampshire? It's New England. Okay. It's New England. Um, the commissioner uh, has promised us updated guidance on that issue. Um, we have yet to receive it. Um, he told superintendents in a recent call that we should view educators as essential workers and therefore they could come back to work, but the students couldn't. Um, many of my colleagues find that problematic, um, that view. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot still to be written on that issue. The more important issue to tonight's conversation is really around our effort to bring more kids back in for the second trimester, or as I've said, in some cases, just after the first of the year. So we were asking people, we were looking at this in two ways as it affects your school. First, in terms of the elementary, the K through five, were we gonna have numbers who wish to come back from the remote learning academy who might make our cohorts problematic, right? So that, that was one issue. W will the numbers rise in terms of in-person to where we're uncomfortable with those numbers? The second was, in terms of the middle level grades, uh, what kinds of models could we create? What kinds of numbers wanted to come back? And as importantly in there, what kind of numbers didn't want to return, right? Was, the, was there a significant number? And then how do we serve those, those students whose parents say, as I understand the model you might propose, I'm not interested in sending my child back to school. How will they be served? Because remember, we have a remote learning academy that new school that Dr. Hobbs created in a week and a half that operates for about 160 kids at the K to four level, still gonna operate for I think over 100 um, for the second trimester, but we don't have a corresponding model at the middle level. We didn't create that. We used your school, we used Seabrook to accommodate kids remotely. And so I think that um, that your principal, uh, looking at the data that we had in front of us, and I think that number, by the way, of the people who responded was something like 27% said they would not, were, were not going to send their children back to school across sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. What percentage participated in the survey? 60-ish, 60, 60% 60 but we followed up with the others. So Susan actually is gonna show you she has actual grade level numbers. So we have like almost 100% we have those numbers. And 27% is, 27% is based pretty, on? Okay, 26%. Is based on the 100%. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, they've done a fantastic job. Uh, so I want to say two things here before I turn it over. First of all, I want to echo everything that Susan said about your teachers and your administration and what they've been able to pull off over these, over these months. They've been amazing. They've been fantastic. Um, and I am proud to work with all of them um, at great sacrifice to themselves. And, and it all, everything you said, Susan, is absolutely true about your teachers and, and, and we're lucky to have all of them. Um, and, and the middle level team has done a great job with your administration in looking at this model and trying to figure out something that works, that gets kids in the building, that honors those kids who's, who right now their parents are saying they're not ready to send them back and makes, all, makes both those things work in, in, in what initially looks like something very difficult to do, right? So Susan, with that, I think I'm gonna turn this over to you.
to, uh, to walk us through um, those discussions and where you are in this recommendation. Thank you. So while they're putting the screen down, I, I just want to start off by saying that um, Becca Carlson, Aisha, and I worked um, collaboratively on all of this together. Um, we, we played around with so many different ideas oh, and um, and we're here to present what we feel is is a, mm -hmm. um, the best solution that we could come up with. So Becca, unfortunately, uh, has to quarantine and so that's why she's not here. So she sends her regrets and please know that she had a very big hand in helping us um, come up with some of these um, thoughts and ideas. So I'm gonna, Aisha's going to go through the first couple of slides that are related to K through five and then I'll pick it up when we get to the six through eight portion. Okay, so the first slide um, goes over, it summarizes our um, survey re results from for pre-K <coughs> through five. So as you can see that the results um, indicated that most RLA families are planning to remain in RLA. We do have three confirmed <coughs> students that wish to return to in-person class um, in grades where we can actually accommodate them. Um, and we still have fifth graders that want to remain in the RLA Seabrook Middle School classrooms. So our recommendations at this point in time is to accommodate the three RLA students, continue our K through five in-person model um, as is, um, we may require some adjustments to space um, used if middle school model makes um, any adjustments. Um, and then also can um, consult with Seabrook Middle School to learn of any changes in their model as well. Right, just can, can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Because remember, they're trying to bring kids back to school as well, right? Yes. And so, so, and so we're gonna be working with them next week. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, can go you ahead. explain to me again the relationship to the Seabrook Middle School model and the so our fifth grade our fifth graders um, are the the one the ones that are in remote they are utilizing the so Seabrook, the Seabrook, okay. Seabrook Middle so School. So Seabrook brings people back they need to then take we'll their be off remote and put them in and we'll communicate okay. with them and then um, work on a plan for them. So some of our trade-offs, um, the pros, students who fam whose families um, chose in-person model can be accommodated five days um, per week with a sh our shortened school day. The in-person learning for primary grade students is key to their developing their early reading skills and that are essential to school success. And our cohort model is working and keeping groups separated to ensure safety. Some of the cons, um, cohort model requires a degree of isolation from grade level peers and other classes. Um, it also limits the movement around the building and requires students to remain in one classroom space. UA classes are de delivered via Zoom in most cases unless outdoor instruction is possible. And now with our weather changing and also deteriorating, our outdoor spaces are becoming less available and comfortable for instruction. So just one quick comment. I want to make sure that it's clear that um, shortened school days does not mean shortened work days for the teachers. Correct. It's because their days compressed with the kids to keep the cohorts together. Correct. And they still need time to prepare and, yes. and do other individual work. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. So we structured the presentation with just to kind of um, highlight the trade-offs in, in everything that we're doing. It's just recognizing that there's, you know, nothing is perfect at this moment. And so there's trade-offs even to um, to what we've been doing with the K-5 students. And when we consider what we may recommend for six to eight, um, we wanted to make sure that the community understands that there's trade-offs in this, in this version as well. And I think some um, families that don't have elementary kids may not have paid attention to some of those trade-offs early on because they didn't affect them. So um, as Dr. Lupini said, the survey results indicated when we, when we got down to all of the phone calls, um, I think it came down to about 26% of our students. So we had a large number. We had, I think it was 12 students in sixth grade that wished to stay fully remote. Um, six students in seventh grade, five or six and um, 11 in eighth grade. So 
it was uh, the highest percentage was actually in sixth grade, but it was between 20 and 30 percent if you broke it down um, by each grade. So um, what we'd like to, what we think we can make work it by by prioritizing the high quality instruction um, that we've been delivering is to have our students come back um, with a limited in-person opportunity and at the same time provide continue to provide the remote instruction to the students who have um, requested it and I think one of the things that we've been very proud of so far is the fact that our middle school team has done an incredible job of delivering the content and establishing relationships with students online and I, we feel like it has been so successful that we don't want to sacrifice that direct connection and that direct instructional time um, at the expense of, of um, other things. So if you want to advance the slide. We had some goals in mind. So there's the next three slides. There's an academic slide, a social emotional slide, and a health and safety slide. So as you can see, um, we want to continue to provide all students with rigorous instruction with the necessary supports in place. So that requires um, the things that are over on the right that you can see. Pacing um, and differentiation within the class, time for remediation, and enrichment within the schedule. Next slide, please. Socially and emotionally, we want to continue to provide students with opportunities to interact with their peers in meaningful ways, practice habits of mind skills in conjunction with academic learning, and independently manage peer relationships in a respectful and inclusive manner. And this really um, is predicated on a safe learning environment and skillful facilitation, which our teachers, I think, are really um, strong with. And then the next slide is health and safety. So we want, to we want to provide students with a safe and healthy learning environment. We want to limit their risk of exposure to COVID-19 and follow existing school-wide procedures and protocols. Um, and in the safest way possible, offer opportunity for some in-person learning when conditions allow. So this would require us to do the same things that we've been doing with the K to five students who have been um, in school in person. It would require masks indoors or outdoors within six feet of anyone. It would require students that do come back into the building to stay in one classroom space with their small group cohort. Um, we would have them continue to complete the daily health screenings. So um, I, I believe that students who come in for other purposes complete the daily health screening, but it's those four questions that we ask all students and staff to complete each morning that might be a bit of a shift for some some families who haven't been doing that at the middle school level. The UA classes would continue to zoom in because the UA teachers are each associated with an elementary cohort, so we wouldn't have them cross over to a different grade level. Um, and students would work with the teachers and students in their cohort only. Lunch would be delivered to their classroom. We're not using the cafeteria, um, so lunch would be delivered to the classroom. Students would eat in the classroom. We'd follow that same shortened school day, which would mean that there wouldn't be um, outdoor recess time because that, that time is already scheduled with the elementary students. And the way we would have to do the middle school schedule with the shortened school day really wouldn't um, allow for it in, in any way. So if you go to the next slide, you can see what we're proposing. We're proposing that each grade attend school in person for one day per week. So there's a number of ways we can accomplish this. Um, in the schedule, but what the, the end result is that to have, because of um, the logistics and the staffing patterns, if we take seventh and eighth grade first, um, in order to have seventh graders attend school in person for a day, it would mean that eighth graders would have an asynchronous day. So they would have one less day of direct instruction um, with their teachers. and and the days that the eighth graders are in, the seventh graders would have an asynchronous day. And what we would propose doing would be to break the groups, um, break each grade up into either three or four sections and have the remote section stay intact. So in other words, um, when the eighth graders come in, we'd have three groups in person, which would be about 10 students. And then we'd have a group of students who are at home and they would be like the remote cohort and the teachers would rotate around to their classroom. So the kids would stay put and the teachers would go 
to their room and deliver the instruction. And then, so for example, if you look at the 830 to 915 block, it says like math, science, ELA, and social studies. So group one that's there in person would get math, group two that's there in person would get science, group three that's there in person would get ELA, and group four that's at home would have the social studies teacher zoom out. So it's not room and zoom, it's the social studies teacher teaching to them remotely as they would um, on the other days. So, so they're in an empty, empty classroom. Right. Teaching now. The teacher. Right. The teacher would be in an empty classroom. Yeah. So it, it fulfills the, um, the it, or it, it takes the room and Zoom uh, worry off the table because there wouldn't be other students in the room. So, and yes. then that would be the case throughout the day. Um, and uh, they, so they would continue to have the enriched virtual learning three days per week one asynchronous day and one in-person day. So we really felt like the, the instructional delivery was, has been so strong in the virtual environment. This gives us a chance to have a number of students in the building at a time that we feel is manageable. Um, I, we don't feel it's manageable to bring all of the kids back in at once. The numbers are too large. We don't have enough staff to to keep them in those small groups and still give them the kind of face-to-face -face instruction that they deserve and um, should be entitled to. And this model allows us to give a similar um, experience to the students who are home. So it was really important to us that that equity be part of our plan. Um, if you want to advance to the next slide, sixth grade looks just slightly different. So sixth grade, because it's a two-person team, we have a couple of options. We could, if we did the same model, um, we would need to have the sixth graders come half one day and half another day. So in this, if you look at that schedule, half of them would come on Monday, half would come on Tuesday, um, and they would have um, enriched virtual learning three days per week, and then they'd have an asynchronous. It would be it would be a similar a similar um, setup for them. Um, the, another option for sixth grade is to have them to have them come in on the same day for just a half a day, um, and then that would the advantage to that would be that uh, they would only have one half a day per week of asynchronous instruction. And I think our sixth grade team is concerned about um, students um, being able to manage a full day of asynchronous work in sixth grade. That their executive functioning and organizational skills in some cases are very well developed and in other cases that's a lot to ask a sixth grader to, to manage their whole day um, without direct instruction from their teacher. We would have um, EAs on call to, to provide some support, but it's not the same as the teacher's instructions. So that is one of the options for sixth grade is to have them um, just come on the same day for a half a day and it could be an SEL half day or it could be an academic half day. We could. Um, we could play around with, with whichever made the most sense in, in that case. Um, I'm trying to remember what I'm forgetting. What am I forgetting, Rachel? Oh, here we go. So we'll go up to the timeline. So we do feel that because of um, the logistics involved, that we would need more than just uh, a few weeks to figure this out. So we would probably do some moving around of the elementary, some elementary, um, two elementary classrooms back to an, the elementary wing to allow the space in the middle school to open back up. Um, so we're looking at proposing a January 11th start date for this. That would allow us time to um, borrow or, or move furniture during vacations. Um, there are some things we need to purchase. So for example, we purchased the plexiglass desk shields and we'd need to purchase more of them because we reallocated them to elementary. Um, so we, we would need to purchase those and the teachers would need some planning time to adjust from their um, enriched virtual learning model to this, which is really a form of a hybrid um, and, and how, they could, how they could structure an asynchronous day to make sure that it's still meaningful for the students. So um, we would, uh, take the first few weeks of the second trimester to, to get ourselves organized and planned um, in a way to make sure that we're successful. And we, and we really, you know, as Dr. Lupini had said before, we feel as if 
um, the work that's been done at, with the elementary students and the procedures and practices that are in place have really been helpful. And so we want to make sure that we do this properly too. And um, we do feel like it would take it would take that time, and it would give us that time to make sure that um, you know that we can we can pull this off. Um, there's one more slide with the trade-offs. So again, these aren't, it says pros and cons, but they're really just meant to be comparative trade-offs. So um, the, the value is providing some in-person opportunity for students whose families wish to take advantage of that. Uh, we're really, like I said before, committed to the equitable access for the remote learners as well. Um, and this, this proposal honors the cohort and pod um, model for student safety and for staff safety. There are some trade-offs. Um, one is for students. I think that sometimes uh, when, when adolescents are picturing coming back to school, they're picturing coming back to school the way it was, and it wouldn't actually look like that. We have found that our elementary students adjusted really well to the changes. We thought that they would, um, we thought that they would really feel like things were so different, and they, and they really have been very resilient and flexible, so uh, we would be hopeful that our middle school students would feel the same way, but they would be in that single classroom. They wouldn't be mixing with the whole grade level. Um, they would have one day of asynchronous instructions. instruction. Um, the teachers would be reimagining some of their routines, and um, we would probably need to move some rooms around to get back to where we were. So those are some of the trade-offs. And this, and again, it's pretty much the same. This, this is a little bit of a redundant slide, I suppose. The only thing that um, really is, is uh, noteworthy is the notion of additional students on the buses that, that could make our buses, the numbers on the buses cause us to revisit um, the safety of how many students are on the bus. That's essentially the presentation, so I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. The fact that you guys are thinking about this, no surprise, but the fact that you're thinking about it so far in advance and recognizing that you need to do additional work, I think is great, so I appreciate this. Um, on one of your slides, you had measure twice, cut once, <laughs> which I love, right? <laughs> but it got me thinking about benchmark assessments. <laughs> and what, if you're not prepared today, it's okay, but I'd like, as you're going through this, to learn more about how you're using benchmark assessments, both pre-K through five and six through eight, um, to inform your decisions and progress, right, and how to redeploy resources. Um, in particular, well, every every grade I think is important. Um, that mid middle school and seventh and eighth, especially eighth, as they're getting ready to transition either to Winnicott it or to apply to other high schools, really making sure um, those kids are the best they can be leaving our school, I think, is, is critical from my perspective. Agreed. So, measure twice. Math and when reading. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a question about the polling that, that you did or the, the surveys? Sure. Um, I'm assuming that those families that did not want to send their children back were children back to school was obviously health concerns and safety concerns. Um, so, so we don't we don't actually know um, what their reasons were, and, and the other thing that that we're not really a hundred percent sure about is, um, the I think the way the questions were worded were were to give us an opportunity to see numbers so that we could come up with a plan, um, and and it's possible that some of the families that that said that they would prefer to stay remote only would consider sending their students one day a week. We don't know. We don't really know the answer to that part because. Right. Um, and what they weren't explicitly asked that. And it's also possible that, um, you know, in that question, some families think that when they say yes, that, that we are able to offer five days back, which, mm -hmm. which we don't feel that we, we are safely able to do. So um, it is possible that some of the students that, whose families elected for the remote could elect to take advantage of the one day a week. We won't know that until we um, move no, forward. No. So then also in that poll, did you ask the question, would, would parents be okay with Zoom and Room? We did not ask that question. Okay. And then, can I ask you a question about the enriched virtual learning? <clears throat> and so when, when this stuff was laid out early on, 
my understanding of enriched virtual learning is, is more than virtual learning. The enrichment part would come from opportunities to come, say, for example, come into school and do like a science lab and interactions like that. How have how has the the enriched how has the enriched portion um, been been implemented in Northampton School for the kids not in school? So it's been it's been done in a couple of different ways. Um, the the block from 145 to 245 is is labeled as what we call a win block. So it's what I need or um, or some enrichment opportunities. So we've utilized that time for. Um, students who wish to participate in advanced Spanish and students who are electing to participate in algebra um, opportunities in math. Um, that's also the time when student government uh, representatives can come in. It's also the time when we've had, um, well actually dur during the whole course of the day, we've had students who require um, um, special education services come in. That's been part of the plan as well. Um, offering them those opportunities and then I believe that um, there are some other clubs that are in the works um, something similar to the Dungeons and Dragons Club but it's a little bit different um, and uh, a lot of this has taken place I know that the uh, we have some teachers that are trying to work out a bicycle a bike club for that time too so we're trying to provide some opportunities some of them have happened quicker than others Thank you for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, th I think I guess my definition of enriched is past. So a lot of things you listed is virtual learning. You know, the wind block, advanced Spanish algebra. That's learning. On that's that's virtual learning. I, I suppose for my interpretation of it, the enriched portion portion would implement things like the bike club and a little bit more in person. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of. I'll be honest, I'm kind of struggling a little bit with, with the proposal. It seems like we're servicing 26% of the population more than we're servicing the majority of the population who want to put their kids back in school. I understand the space implications and the cohort implications, but I, was, I guess I was really expecting more in person uh, for 6, 7, 8, especially I guess in grade 7 where it's such a small classroom. I mean, you could almost put that whole class back into school. Um, Full time. It's Except you can't think about seven separate from eight because of your teachers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I. Because you have one team, right? So you can't think about seven separate from eight. You have one team. If it was a large middle school with a seventh grade team or multiple seventh grade teams, you'd have that luxury, but you don't. So, so on that, I mean, if it's seventh, if it's seventh and eighth, and it's a team, totally get that. And I might just be missing something here. If the seventh graders were in school and a teacher was teaching a seventh grade class, and then they would normally go to teach an eighth grade class in a different room, couldn't they go to that different room and zoom out to the eighth graders? So can't, I mean, can't, it, can't you still have a team and one set of kids is in school, and one set of kids is out? I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're asking. That. That's kind of what we propose to have right. one teacher zoom out for each of those class sessions to the students who are at home. So, so I, I was tagging on to part of what it Greg is. was saying, which is that the seventh grade class is so small that from a space perspective, that whole class would probably come back in and be in school five days a week. Dr. Lupini responded by saying, but you can't think about seventh without thinking about eighth. And I said, right on, but let's think about it differently, right? Can you think about it in a way that says, if I'm teaching the eighth grade, uh, seventh grade class live in person, and I'm a part of a team, and then I have to teach the eighth grade class, and I move to a different classroom and zoom out to the eighth grade class? It, it's it's a different model. I was just tapping off of what what Greg asked, and maybe it doesn't make any sense. That, that's essentially there. what they are going to do right. some days. Right. I mean, some days. But great, yeah. according to this, grade seven is in class is in person once a week. Right. Yes. Well, that's 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 what Greg's saying, right? Not one day a week. We're saying if you do it one day a week, can you do it every day? Well, we we really looked carefully at the numbers of kids we felt we could safely bring into the building at one time, and um, we have a limited number of bathrooms. We have um, 
we're, we're, we've really been successful in limiting the opportunities for for cross pod exposure and cross cohort exposure and the more kids you have in the building the more you increase that possibility and our bathroom spaces like they, I'm worried about that piece yeah. quite honestly just in and of itself because um, we've been able to provide that, like a separate bathroom for each grade except one grade that has to share and so um, you know in terms of the number of rooms we have available and the number of teachers we have available for face-to-face -face instruction it, it, it doesn't match up to bring more kids in at a time because you know what you have to remember is our, our middle school model and if you go back to the conversation that we had at, at the budget table uh, around the recommended class sizes they're much larger at the middle school level which is what creates this situation where we can't really you take one class one grade and you really you know with 40 kids you have to divide them into four groups you can't in, in during a pandemic whereas typically we only divide them into two groups and be able to accommodate them so you know we, we don't have the staff and we don't feel that it's educationally sound to be zooming out to groups of kids that don't have a teacher in the room that you know that don't have the opportunity what you have to what you have to picture the difference between being zoomed out to in school and being zoomed out to at your home is that your child has their own computer and their own screen and the teacher can interact with them directly, see what they're doing, talk to them directly. When a teacher zooms into a room, the teacher can't really see all the kids and the kids can't necessarily like raise their hand and get that attention from the teacher because of just the logistics. They can't see every face. They can't, they, there's not a microphone for them to all talk back to. When they're home on their own computer, the level of interaction is very different. So we really feel strongly that it's not educationally sound to, to have a teacher in one room and zoom out to three other rooms at the same time, which I think is what you might be getting at with, by having more kids in No, it was, but that's okay. No? So the okay. answer might be that if you had that whole seventh grade in, then you can't have some of the eighth graders in too because there's too many kids in the school at that, point, at that time, which, which I get. Um, and I, I wasn't suggesting to have the kids sitting there and the, the teachers in them. Yeah, I guess that's the end of the presentation if you want to You can turn that, that off so and they put can it up. See. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I just make a comment about the 26% though? Because, uh, be, because I've been criticized in these data that we've gotten back, uh, particularly at the high school level, that I worry too much about the 18% who've indicated they don't want their children to come back to school. Um, I'll say all day long on that, guilty as charged, I worry about all of them. Um, but, but I actually think this model doesn't rely on the 26% or focus on the 26%. I think this model is creative in a way that our discussions at the high school and at another middle school haven't been able to be because what Susan's done is just incorporated them as another section and has teachers moving to them while these other kids are in the building. So there, there isn't as much built, built around them as I'll just say in some of the preliminary conversations that we've had at the high school level. So I don't think the one day a week is nearly as focused on that 26% as what I've experienced in some other conversations. They're, they're just another section in this model. They're just another section, right? Yeah, I mean, if they all came back, it would be the same, really. Right. If they all came back, it would be the it'd same. Be the, it, it would be the same schedule. Right, they, right, exactly. It would just be in person. What if they all came back? What if everyone said, I'll play the what if game, but we have a space problem. Yeah, so, so we would probably recommend the same thing, I think, for numbers and for, for space. Not to bring space. everybody back, even if everyone wanted to come back. We don't, I, don't, I don't see how we can, we, we can't teach them all We day can long do it every day of the week, groups. everyone, because the way you make this work is you have one grade at a time, and, and so that limits the number you have in the building at any given time. Whereas if you have them all, you've tripled the number. about the asynchronous learning. Um, do you have experience with that with middle schoolers right now and some success with that? Are you worried about that at all? 
we we are concerned about that actually because we're worried about the you know kids being on their own for the day for the most part um, and like I said we will have uh, someone available to check in but you know they'll be given assignments to, to do asynchronously in order to accommodate the in-person part which is which is one of the trade-offs I mean we like I said we've been feeling I, I know there's a variety of opinions but but we've been feeling that the that our our remote instruction has been very effective so um, this it, it in order to get kids in for a day it means we have to um, have to leave them with the asynchronous work to do on one day is there a, do you find the families that support their children the asynchronous learning is much more successful and sometimes difficult for some families versus other families I, you know it's, it's interesting that you say that I mean I, I've had teachers say that you know, I think I think the thing to remember is, is there are kids who are struggling with the remote learning, um, and that there's also kids who struggle in person, and that just being back in school doesn't mean there's no more struggle. There's there are things that um, it, for for some students the remote platform is actually um, takes some anxiety away for them, and for others it probably creates more. So it's very I think it's a very individual. Um, Set of circumstances, who's who, yeah, who gets who, who finds more success with with each individual um, component, but 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 asynchronous learning requires more of a self motivated and organized student, and so it would be our hope to provide the scaffolding and the structure within Google Classroom and within the the um, direct instruction to enable students to be able to 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 work effectively on those days. Great skills required. Yeah, I mean there there are skills that they that they need. Right. Yeah. yeah for, I mean, for as much as I'm pushing to get kids back in school, what, what I like even less is asynchronous learning for children at home mm -hmm. that that aren't being instructed at all. Mm -hmm. I think that the those two spots that I'm staring at are are not good. All we're doing is putting in seventh and eighth graders in once a week, and then we're taking away from them. Uh, instruction um, once a week as well so it's not and I don't know if the one one time in school in person is that advantageous that that it's worth putting them in once a week because another on a Friday they're not going to get anything but I agree with you like and that's what we said in August yeah that's what, <laughs> that's what we said in August when we recommended the remote model that's why exactly what you just said that's why. It's I'd love to see those two asynchronous go to in person, and I would challenge you to find the space in the school. We have a cafeteria and a gymnasium that has a ton of space in it that we haven't utilized yet. So I think we still have space that we can play with. We just haven't played there yet. So I, I guess I, I would have to express my very strong opinion that those are not adequate instructional spaces for core instruction. So there's no. You know, the acoustics in the gym and the cafeteria are no. horrible. There's, no there's, there's a beanbag women. chair in there's a kid's corner women. of his, who will his teach basement. Them? Like, nothing well, is right. standard right women. now. Who will teach them? The trade-off of having a group of teachers who are having a group of students in front of them is that you're going to have to create asynchronous. That's what you just said. You're going to have to have asynchronous. So she can say, I can bring them in. And I don't know who's going to teach them. There's no solution there. There's literally no solution. Well, this is the trade-off we've talked about since August. But we were asked to create in-person opportunities. And yeah. so that's why, and, and by the way, people who are watching, you can come in this auditorium next Tuesday and the following Wednesday, and you're going to hear the same conversation for Seabrook Middle School and the high school because there are trade-offs. And the limitation is space, correct? No, the and limitation staff. is teachers. Well, well, so he, he just said. It's li it, it, so, well, it's some so combination it's not, depending on, on the situation it, we're it, looking at, right? With staff, it, it's a matter of how many, how many students the teacher is standing in front of, right? So if I have a class, I have a class, what they're saying is cut the class in half so half is asynchronous and, and half is not. 
if it's a matter of how many students I'm standing in front of, correct? Or how many people can be in, in the building? So it's not really a staff issue, it's a space issue, which is back to Greg's point. And then the question is, is the trade-off better to have bad acoustics or asynchronous learning? But again, who, who would be in the gym with them? And what would they be so, doing? So it's not space, because the, 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 the question to, to my question was, who's going to teach them? I know, but, but it's not a who's going to teach them. It's how many people are they teaching at a time? Let me actually go back to it. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm looking at it the wrong way. Hold on. Well, right, you can't do that at the same time. I guess that's why I'm, I'm like, I, I is that the absolute only solution that, that we have available to us? That's a fair us? question. So we feel pretty strongly in, you know, if, if, if kids aren't safe and healthy, they can't learn. And so if they're all getting sick, we'd be closing the school down. And what we found success with are small groups that we can maintain a cohort with. So this model proposes small groups that are in a cohort that are um, separated. And, and in order to do that, I think what you're suggesting is, is regular class sizes, which we don't feel follows the guidelines or we don't feel that that's safe. And we also, you know, would be concerned with the, just the sheer numbers in the small area and in that middle school wing. If it's just it's it's not it's not safe. It is, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I mean, that's why we that's why you know I talked to Dr. Lupini about how to best present this, and you know we ended up with the notion of of presenting the trade offs because that's what it is. It's trade offs. There's no perfect solution. Even the K five kids that are there, it's not perfect. It's it's a pandemic. We're living with restrictions, and um, we're you know. We felt that this was a model that 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 um, accomplished what was requested of us, which was to to, was to get middle school students into the building. Can I ask you? Do you and your staff think that bringing kids in for one day is worth the trade-off? <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't. Um, Sorry, I'll let you answer. It doesn't feel that way. It's it's a hard thing to answer because we haven't had them in yet. Um, I, I'm 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 worried that that students won't be happy with the location they have to stay in for the day. Uh, you know, there's things that we're worried about, um, and and we are concerned about an asynchronous day when they're having five days a week of high quality instruction right now. So it's a trade off for sure. It's it's. I mean, I wish I had the crystal ball. But you know, there's things. There's a lot of things. I mean, in, in all honesty, we take our responsibility to keep students and staff safe really seriously. Like it's, it, it's a weight that that um, is really difficult. I mean, the teachers are worried about the kids. They're worried about their. They're worried about families. They're worried. You know, it's it's a very difficult time with the pandemic, and so. Um, we're trying to balance the needs and the wants of the community and of the students, and um, there's a trade-off with everything. It seems like based on the enthusiasm of the young woman who presented, that she just was so energized to be with her peers, mm -hmm. even if it was a small subset mm -hmm. of her peers. I mean, we're, we're willing to give this a try. We think it's worth trying, um, but it's not without a worry. I guess is, is what I can say. And to your point, my um, my son, who is in sixth grade, had an opportunity to go in for about an hour and a half last week, uh, mm -hmm. and was over the moon, excited to 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 be able to do that, to go in, um, to play, to see his friends off the screen. Um, I think giving an opportunity that you are presenting here to kind of those kids. Um, to me, uh, I guess, and looking at it, how my son reacted to that and how much they look forward to that, even if it is one day. The asynchronous day, sure, maybe we will have to put in little guidelines as parents on them to get the work done. Um, but I think, I think it would be huge for them, even if it is one day. I, I feel looking at it from, again, just my own 
my own son and that one opportunity that he has had uh, since the beginning of school. Uh, how, how much that meant to him yeah. to be there for an hour and a half and, and see 10 kids. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's, it's worth just saying again that, you know, our ultimate goal is to have everybody back in school with a regular schedule. I mean, we built, we, last spring, we built a, a wonderful schedule <laughs> for the school day that we, that we thought was a real improvement over the schedule from the year before. And, and when, when we built it in the spring, we really envisioned that, we, that it wouldn't be like this right now, that we'd be back in school, you know, regular school days. And so there's, there's nothing we want more, but um, we know that we need to do it safely. And so I think it takes some steps that maybe don't feel like enough sometimes, but um, this, this would be, this, this is what we came up with to, to, to bring to you for your discussion. I think I'm having trouble reconciling the commentary around it's a pandemic, we need to think differently, things aren't going to be the same, and then all of a sudden we're not considering the gymnasium or the cafeteria because it's not a, it's got bad acoustics. Like that is the definition of it's a pandemic, we need to think differently and look at different spaces. And, and so there's a contradiction out there floating, floating around that I'm having a hard time with, and I'm not trying to shoot down the proposal. I'm, I'm concerned about asynchronous for obvious reasons. And I guess it's, it's, a, it's a puzzle that, that um, I don't have all the numbers and the spaces and the square footage and the kids in front of me, I, it's, or the number of the classes. Um, I would just challenge you, if you put the gymnasium and the cafeteria back in the mix as a space for learning, does that change the results of of what you're presenting. And I know there's a staffing challenge as well there. Well, well again, no, not really, because the, t the teacher, in this proposal, the teachers are fully booked. They would be booked with more students in front of them if you use the bigger space. So when you split some of these, some of these, so great. So are you suggesting that we put 20 students into the gym no. and have the teacher teach in the gym? Is that what you're suggesting? No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting any uh, changes in safety protocols. I'm, I'm then, then I don't understand what the what the point of using the gym for an, an, an instructional space would be if we have an instructional piece, space that accommodates ten kids. I mean, Aisha, do you have anything to add? Because I feel like I feel like you're asking me a question okay. and, and I'm answering the best I can, but I'm not uh, answering I'm what you're asking for some reason. Do you have another way to put it? I'm trying to understand the question as well. Okay. Um, and so you're saying you have the space to accommodate all the kids in the class, or all the cohorts. If you bring the eighth grade back in one day a week, you have the space and the staff to accommodate. For one grade at a time. For one grade at a time, but and you can only do it one day at a time. days, it meant more asynchronous time because it's the way the staff right. works. Right. So if mm. they came in two days a week, then they'd have two and a half days of asynchronous. It, it's, it's not a win. We looked at a lot of different models. One of the other things we looked at was trying to compress the morning, um, I guess the core subjects all done um, remotely, and then bring the kids in in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Even that schedule didn't work well. Uh, let, me so see, let me see if this helps. In, in, in uh, our neighboring SAU, they have a two-day, in our neighboring SAU, they have a two-day in, three-day out model. So there's a group in Monday, Tuesday, there's a group in Thursday, Friday. Wednesday, they all have an online experience in the morning with planning time and all in the afternoon. So. They don't have to do asynchronous for all of those two days that you're not in because they're large enough that they were able to actually extract the team who can work part of those asynchronous days. Mm -hmm. But essentially, you still have two asynchronous days. So the trade-off 
of that hybrid model to get kids in two days was essentially two asynchronous days. That's the trade-off. And are they filling those as asynchronous days? Well, or they again, they're the large day? enough at the middle, and again, the middle school, they're large enough that my understanding is they were able to take one team, one team, put together a team, a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade team, one team. And those people have some experiences with kids on those two days, some experiences, but it's largely asynchronous. Yeah. But that's the trade-off for these models. So, so I, just one observation. So Dr. Snyder, I can only speak for myself, but I, I, I want to recognize the amount of work that has been done here, and it, it's a, I appreciate it. Um, and I know that the questioning can be frustrating. That's not my intention at all. This is really kind of exploring stuff and figuring out how we do exactly as you said, get as close to getting all the kids in at once as we can and isolating the issues one at a time. So we know space isn't an issue now. We know asynchronous learning can be. We know the cohorts need to be 10 each. So you know, are there other solutions like putting a study hall in the, in the cafeteria with an EA so one of the cohorts can go in and actually do some of their asynchronous work um, for part of the day but they also have live um, instructional time the same day, and maybe have a, an EA in the in the room to kind of help proctor and, and keep them again ten in the cohort, just using all the space. So asynchronous isn't at home. It's asynchronous, at exactly. Asynchronous isn't at home. It's like a study hall, and it's not all day. It's for. Well, you said you had EAs available when they were asynchronous? We don't have one available because they're already doing, like, I, maybe I usually can speak to the special education component because mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a factor in here that we definitely have special education students and their services. Yeah. And we do, all of our EAs are special education EAs. So yep. do you want to please yeah. explain how that's working? Because that, that's a layer that may, may be providing other content to you about the gap. Yes. So, um, with special education, we have um, students at the middle school um, grade um, level that are coming in um, for services um, that have opted in. Um, but we also have EAs that are attached to each, um, the sixth grade, the seventh and eighth grade, um, that are supporting in the um, enriched virtual learning, but also for special education services in person. Um, and then there's also the space component as well when the students are coming in for special education that they're going in for their OT, some speech and language in those spaces as well. Um, I'm hoping I'm, I'm answering the question correctly. Um, so it, it adds another, like um, Susan said, it adds another layer of compo another component as to who, how many kids are coming in and those things. So even the kiddos that may be remote academically, even that small 26%, they still could be coming in for special in-service, um, in-person services. Um, so we do have to consider that. And also in, we are at that, the, that one part in the in the hierarchy of, of needs is that safety piece. And that's where our proposal first starts with. How are we keeping not only our students safe, but how are we keeping our staff safe? And that cohort model has helped us quarantine only two classrooms, albeit one grade one and grade three, only for two weeks and bring them right back in. Mm -hmm. So then once we have that safety component down, where we're all safe and the kids are safe and we're demonstrating that safety through data and those things, then we can look at equity. And once we have that data and that we're providing equitable education for all of our students and however that may look, whether it's in-person, um, enriched virtual learning, RLA, um, then we can go into the, the social emotional and then the teaching component as well. So I think we're still in between that, that safety piece and that equity. Um, as far as space is concern, concerned, your, your concerns about the gym and the, um, the cafeteria, I hear it and I understand it. 
Um, but like Dr. Lupini said, if even with an EA, I don't, I can't see an EA splitting themselves between supporting students in the classrooms in another part of the building and then coming into the, and then at the same time no, supporting. They can't, can't be two places at once. It would be Correct. a trade-off. It would be, yeah. it would be saying, hey, the greater good is to take that EA out of that classroom and put them in to be with these, this cohort of 10 that's doing remote. But we also, have to be, we also have to be considerate of there may be a student that, or a couple of students that have an, a shared EA or a one-to-one. -one. Yeah, so, so you can't take it away from the one-to-ones, totally get that. Um, anyways, so we may not solve this tonight, and you guys have done a lot of work, and Susan, you said that the work needs to continue because you may not have all the answers yet. From my opinion, it was some of this was just thought starters to say, how do we get exactly, as you said, Dr. Snyder, how do we get all kids in as fast as we can I, I, while I keeping it safe? Dr. Snyder, but I'm not. I, I apologize. <laughs> okay. um, you, just elevated me. you just got promoted. <laughs> yeah. It was your presentation. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for, uh, for correcting me. Um, you know, we're, we're still working on it, and I get it. Um, I appreciate your thinking about this. I, we're not trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> just trying to think through this. Yeah, I, I want to echo Tom, uh, Tom's sentiments, uh, just asking questions and being annoying that's kind of like a working process it's a shame that we have to do it in public sometimes but please don't be offended um i really appreciate all the work that um that you guys are doing i know it's a hard puzzle to solve i just uh, it's uh you know one of the things that that's looking at looking at this differently is as educators i, I don't see the educational value in, in putting kids in one room to be asynchronous work I, I don't see what the win is there educationally, and, and for us, it's a, it's a risk of bringing too many kids into the building at once and not being able to manage their physical proximity and um, you know their adherence to our to our guidelines with with one EA and you know just yeah. I mean, from a learning at I don't see the educational win there. It wasn't a matter of parking them in a room all day with one EA. It's a matter of um, creating a schedule where they may, now right now, they're asynchronous one day in one day. And when they're in that day, they're going to get all their classes. And when they're out, they're not going to get any. Bringing them all in, safe space. If I have science on, the, for, on my normal day in, maybe I have science on my asynchronous day. Uh, but then I've got a study hall in the other one. So that they're, they're back and forth, not sitting in a room all day. Um, in study hall, but they, they they split it so that they've got little chunks each day. Half, you know, half a day is asynchronous in school, asynchronous. Half a day is in-person learning. So, so it, that that actually occurred to me now. But I think if we're going to have them in school, we'd yeah. rather have them than be intentional with their teaching full time. And and I think I think what what you're proposing is going to add numbers that we're not comfortable with. So that may be the problem. So, yeah. But if we have the space, and if, I don't think it's a, if it's a numbers problem, it's a numbers problem. I don't think it's an education problem because better for a kid to be in class with a, a friendly adult presence in the room saying, do your asynchronous work because you've got English class in 20 minutes. Yep. Um, and then they go to English class and they come back and it's do your asynchronous work because you've got an hour before whatever the next class is, than to have a full day asynchronous in front of the TV. Right. I mean, we talk a lot about like educational value. It's not just a, it's part of the educational value is the socialization side of it. And we talk about the social and emotional all the time. And, and this is a chance for the kids to be together, even in like a study hall or in, in yep. an interim basis. It's a chance for the kids to be together, which we're, we're talking continually about is something that these kids that kids are missing. But if it's a safety issue, if it's a numbers issue, then we need to say that. Right. If it's a space issue, we need to say that. But it's not a space issue. So, I, so then I'll, I'll ask you this question and put you on the spot once again in the public meeting. But don't worry, no one's here and no one's watching at home because yeah, they don't. Um. <laughs> oh, hey, 41 people. 
is it better to keep this all enriched virtual learning than to sacrifice that eight asynchronous day? I know there's pressure from the public. There's been pressure from us to put people back in school, but like, like straight talk. Do you think as an educator, it's more beneficial to keep the kids at home than to create an asynchronous day that's un, un, unstructured? So I, I, these people know I've taken to quoting the joint board chair on this. So in terms of, of the academic program that's been created and in terms of delivery of instruction, um, the model that's been created is better, the, 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 the remote model. Mm -hmm. But there's more to education than that, yep. right? So Jim often says, because Southampton's back in, in school, that, that, um, that even if there were trade-offs and even if there were things gonna happen that were gonna disrupt that model and whatever, that that opportunity to be in, in the room, what, what, what Nermina just described, that opportunity is worth something, right? That's important. That's my question, right? is it worth more than the asynchronous day? <laughs> um, I, I personally think it, 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 it's important, right? Do, is it more important? Does it make the asynchronous uh, 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 a, uh, uh, acceptable? Um, yeah, I think some incorporation of that piece into a model is important for kids. Yes. Good question. I mean, we could we could go back and look at what was supposed to be the six days, which relied more heavily on the the remote instruction and just the half a day back then. It just provided the kids much less asynchronous time. But but much less in much less in person time as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. right. Two, so you have two because it's a trade off. Right. So if one of the things that you were you were really trying to minimize was the asynchronous time, we could you know we could go with half days in, in person and then they they would do the whole day asynchronous. Um, you could do it for first seven and eight. So we tried to present things that as the options and and trade offs because. We have talked about this social and emotional right. um, issue with kids, uh, and and again, uh, just from a personal uh, point of view here, uh, I feel like it's asynchronous day. Uh, I don't see that being a, a day in front of a TV, but maybe catching up on reading, catching up on work, and doing your math problems, and and doing what you need. I mean. Um, my son's in uh, online classes now, and he's at his desk, and I don't even see him for the day, even when I'm working from home. Um, does what he needs to do, and, and this is the younger of the grades. Um, these are not, you know, first graders and second graders. I think they're easier to work with for that one day to say this is what you're gonna do, uh, and do it, but um, I think um, I think it's it's a start. It's, it's big, I think it's important to the kids. I yeah, really do. I, I have. I, I don't. I don't disagree that I've. I've had. I've heard and received a significant amount of yeah. feedback. The opposite that it, that remote learning is extremely challenging and it's not working for my family. Mm -hmm. And asynchronous is a nightmare because my kids won't do anything and I have to work. And like it's. And all it depends on the situation. And all yeah. of those things are true. Yeah. 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 All yeah. of those things are true. Depending on the family and the child. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't wait to get to the finance report. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to, to let really us Really nice talk. Really us, thoughtfully uh, done. Yes. I really appreciate it. Thank question. you. Yep. Sorry. Um, Greg. Greg, there's one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Thing. We got a late one coming from Mark. Hopefully it'll be uh, it'll be One more question, Susan. <laughs> the last uh, slide of the presentation talks about staffing changes for fourth and fifth grade. Does that affect their ability to be in the school full time? No, what that's in relation to is the fact that um, our eighth grade math teacher is also an interventionist in fourth grade and our seventh grade math teacher is an interventionist in fifth grade and they've been pushing into classrooms and so they would continue to support students in fourth and fifth grade but in a pullout model. So then they've been uh, like 
pod support member. So in other words, we're not having any substitute teachers so that if a teacher's out, we're relying on other um, staff in the pod to fill in for them. So in the case of Drew Zuliga, he's the eighth grade math teacher and he's also supporting fourth grade math. Right. Um, so he's, he, in this model, he could still support fourth grade students out of the classroom, but we wouldn't have him pushed in and we wouldn't have him cover the class for the teacher anymore. We'd only have him see like the students that he needed to see. So that, that's the impact. It's not, it, it doesn't affect their ability to be in school. It just, it's just a staffing piece because we have that crossover with the two math teachers. Thank you. Yep. All right, Matt, here's the moment you've been waiting for. This is why you put your tie on today. <laughs> um, so yes, the, the year data expenditure report is included um, in your packets. There, there really have not been any significant variance from last month, but I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I just question on the tents. Are we getting rid of all the tents or one of the tents? So those will all be removed for export? And as, and as I've mentioned in previous um, board meetings, that that is that is reflected in uh, the facilities account, um, page five. You'll see under buildings equipment, we're over budget um, by $38,000 and a good portion of that is due to the tents. Any other questions from Matt? Nope. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. All right. Next is the administration report. So I included the October report in addition to the November report because that was um, an oversight. I thought I had submitted the October report last month and it didn't make it all the way through. So that's kind of old news that we discussed at the last meeting. And the November report, um, I believe that we've covered most everything in there except um, that this is just all good news. You ready for the all good news? Yep. Um, the talent show. So um, we feel as if we can still uh, pull off a version of a talent show with the help of Mrs. Zavez and Mrs. Oliver. And so we are really seeking out those talented students that want to submit a video and um, we're hoping to put together a virtual talent show. So I think that those requests um, have already been sent out and I think the number one request is uh, a talent number by the school board. So when you when you have your act Isn't ready, what? you can submit that to uh, Mrs. Zavez. <laughs> you just thought of that no, during the last session, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so real, I mean, the, you can you can see the written report. There's really nothing okay. um, else that's new. But the talent show, I think, um, we're looking really looking forward to. And then what, just one other thing that I'll just share because it's kind of fun. Um, Mrs. Zavez and Miss um, Nardone had students. Um, they took pictures of each teacher and they had all the students in every class draw or paint their teacher in a mask yeah. and they're all in the hallway downstairs so we're going to take just a little video and post it of just the artwork because it's it's really adorable artwork with all the of each teacher in their mask and their photo next to them so right. it's kind of fun That's but good. yeah so we're looking forward to the talent show and 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 we will take your um submission if you choose to submit one we make nominations. <laughs> and I'm <gonna> you. <laughs> okay, so that covers off on both uh, administration reports. Uh, personnel will do a non-public. <coughs> Our next meeting uh, for the Northampton School Board is December 3rd at 6:30, and uh, we'll be in. We'll be in here. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we would. Uh, right now, our plans are: if we're going to do face-to-face, -face, we're going to be here. Okay, and just a reminder for the rest of the board members, we have a joint board meeting on Monday, November 9th, that's next Monday, and that is all uh, virtual through Zoom. 
So, Mr. Duffy, I'd like to make a roll. I mean, make a nomination to go into the non-public under RSA 91A32B. I'll second. Roll call vote. Yes. 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 Yep. No, it's only 8.30. I have 8.30, so. <laughs> well, I guess walk across the Can we stop this and then come back? We did that. I thought we'd walk across the hall and stand in that way for a couple of minutes to do this. Let us know when you're ready. So, do you have to make a motion to come out of non public and public? No. I think we do no public. Do we need a roll call coming out of non-public or we're good? I'd like to make a motion to come out of non-public. Second. Yes. 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 Thank you, Rhonda. All right, we have a teacher's position under public meeting resume. I'd like to make a motion to approve the half-time teacher position at an estimated total cost of $39,200 for the remainder of the current year 2020-2021 only. I'll second. Any further discussions? Nope. Okay. Ready for a vote? Yes. 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 <laughs> All right. That brings us to the end. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. We got it done before nine. Thank you. Yes. 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 yes.